Hey guys, welcome back to episode 22 of Calculated Chaos. Today I'm here with Megan Scully. How are you, Megan? I'm really good, Tara. How are you? Thank you very much for having us here to, uh, in Limerick today, <laughs> as you can see. <laughs> welcome to my studio. <laughs> yeah. So can you quickly introduce yourself and we'll go from there. Yeah, so I am a Galway girl and a Limerick lady. I always say that because Galway is home and that's where the home house is. And Limerick is has been home now for... Wow, it's since 2015 actually. Um, but I went to university here back in 2007, so I've kind of dipped my, my toes here a couple of years ago and yeah. um, always loved Limerick as a city and I'm delighted to be back here. Um, I'm here Monday to Friday presenting the Limerick Post Show, which is an online kind of magazine style TV show um, where we go out and about to Limerick, we go to events, we go to sporting events, um, we interview musicians, and maybe if there's like an opening of something, um, all kind of positive good news stories. And the aim is to kind of show the people of Limerick um, all that's going on in Limerick City and County, but then also for those who aren't in Limerick to see how much is going on here and what a busy place we are. Mm. Um, so it's great to be doing something like that, that is, you know, so positive and so much fun. So I present and produce that show and then I've keen who does camera and editing as well and uh, I have to say it's it's just really fun like every day is different we're out and about we're all around the place um, we do some interviews in here and um, it's just kind of I suppose it's great because it's so much variety so then that is Monday to Friday mm. Saturdays I and Sundays I present on Classic Hits which is Dublin based um, but it's a national station so I have my own kind of music show on Saturdays from 11 to 2 which is the 80s 90s more kind of classic tracks which is a mixture of everything and then on Sundays I present Guaranteed Irish which is an Oscailga Beirla show so it's the bilingual um, and it's only Irish music it's classic Irish songs but also brand new Irish songs as well so mm. it's great because it has the mix of two and it means I get to interview and meet upcoming Irish artists and play their music which is always exciting and I have to say the Irish music scene is stronger than ever and then job number three is um, I'm a news panellist on the Today Show with Donny and Mora and RT which is um, I'm, I'm on Mondays mainly so like every second Monday I'm down at the Cork studio um, just chatting about like the topical news stories so mm. it's kind of usually current affairs but um, kind of pop culture and I suppose things that are like trending in social media so mm. I love that so I'm getting all areas of media in and also I am writing my my second book now as well so I'm an author so uh, I guess that is my four main job titles <laughs> yeah kept very busy anyway uh, certainly am um, so I suppose we met through Zeminar yes. so we spoke on the same day on Zeminar it was back in October wasn't it wasn't it, it was it was um the 10th or 11th of October, I believe, was on across yeah. those few days. It was early, yeah. Yeah, we were we were both on the Tuesday. Yeah. That was yeah. It. How did you end up getting in with that? Um, it was um, it was Damien and, and Ian that both approached me actually and mentioned to me. Now I've been watching Zeminar for since it started, and I always thought that was kind of something that I wanted to really um, speak at because um, my first book, Broken Love, was kind of aimed at millennials and Gen Z as well. And um, I remember seeing the very first one in the RDS and thought this is such a good event, and it was the first of its kind. And I was kind of like that would be like the dream event for me to speak at. Um, but um, since. The, I suppose it first came out and since I spoke at it I've actually been speaking at other events across Ireland um, events for young people for all generations for all age groups and I think that is where maybe the guys came across my I, I share videos for my talks I think that's how they found me mm. and they reached out to me and of course as soon as they asked I was like absolutely so I was delighted mm. um, and it was great to speak to so many young people and to kind of I suppose get messages of hope across as well and uh, it was a really interesting day and I'm uh, hopefully looking forward to the next one yeah yeah, no, absolutely. Because uh, they only have recently posting your your clips yes. up on YouTube. Because I know they're rolling it out over over the next year or so. But um, yeah, no, it was that was a really amazing day. Like I was in, I was like three years ago, I was a TY in the audience yeah. in the RDS, and it was funny. I'm really certain Owen McDermott was speaking. I remember he was sitting there in the audience going. Man, I wish I was up on that stage. I was like, that was the that goal. was that was like the thought process going because I always love public speaking and it was the sitting there going like, oh, I'd love to be up on that stage and like the the kind of full circle thing when eventually like one week beforehand, literally one week, Damien went, do you want to choose more install? I went, yes, please, yeah, just give it to me, yeah, amazing. I'll show up. But um, that was a really amazing event and hopefully. Hopefully they might bring you back in next year. <laughs> well, especially because you were so close in age to those that were sitting yeah. there, which was amazing. So it's incredible to be able to do that. And like, I think that's a, one thing that a lot of people should learn from is that like, you know, you can set these goals at any age and achieve mm. them in a short space of time. Yeah. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that was kind of the whole premise of my talk is that like, you're not too young to start. Like, I feel like some people, like, I feel like because this, like, this age with the internet and everything, we have so much capabilities mm. of 
getting following your dreams, whether that be in music, you know, like you're seeing so many, I'm seeing so many young artists and you're seeing on the Sunday show with our Guaranteed Irish, you're seeing these young artists mm -hmm. that are trying to build their own platform and starting to get recognition, you know, hundreds of thousands of streams, you know what I mean? And they started from, well, they're still just recording out of their house, you know what I mean? So the fact that something as simple as that, that with regards to music, business, YouTube, you now can get out there. You don't yeah. need to wait for a record label. You don't need to wait for that person to give you the thumbs up. You can go get after it and, um, I think that's a really cool day of people really reinforcing that, obviously the whole mental health aspect of it as well. So, um, you were born in Galway. I was uh, born in Dublin, actually. Born in Dublin. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't say that as much. So I was actually born in Dublin. Okay. I know, I'm from everywhere. Yeah. So I was born in Dublin, raised in Galway and living in Limerick. Okay, so what age did you move to Galway at? Um, I was five years old, so I was halfway through um, baby infants in Dublin. Oh, um, we lived in Dundrum and um, my parents separated at that time yeah. and then mum decided she wanted to raise us closer to home because home was Galway. Well, actually, both her parents were originally from Galway. It was typical of the 80s. Met, got married and moved to Dublin. That was kind yeah. of what everyone did. Um, and then when they separated, then mum said, I'd rather bring you close to home. But she was like, wasn't ready to go home, home just yet herself. So um, a friend called up and said, why don't you come to Spittle in Connemara? So mum just said, let's do it. So up we packed our bags and went to Spittle in Connemara. Not a bit of Irish between us. Yeah. Um, never lived beside the beach before, like completely like unknown to us. And stay there for five years and I was like those were the five most amazing years for me um, I called them I called Spiddle my spiritual home my mum and I say that yeah. we still go out and visit quite a lot and um, that's where the Gaelic obviously developed like we were we went into school sure as I said we hadn't a bit of Irish and it was all Irish yeah. everything everything yeah. the only thing that wasn't Irish was English and uh, the English class um, um, but like because I suppose you're that young and you're you're like a sponge we just took in all the Gaelga and then yeah. I just kept it and that's what that's why I went on to study Irish in university because mm. my love for Spittle yeah so it's great no, it is a lovely spot and obviously I'm from Galway as well so I would know Spittle very well and um, and then when you were 10 what part of Galway did you move to then after that then we moved to Ardrahan which is south Galway which is near Gort and yeah. that's where mum and dad originally from oh okay so we right. moved back to where granny is granny Sadie is there so we ended up uh, building a house right beside her and now there's like pretty much all my aunties and uncles are all in the one area so it's like taken over by all of our family okay so that's still home now that's where mum has stayed and then mum stayed there and I suppose since I was there till I moved to Limerick for my undergrad and then yeah so I've kind of been moving around since. And you did your undergrad in journalism? Yeah, um, on Real Gags and the Manora, Irish and oh, New Media Studies, yeah. Okay. So there was no journalism in UL at the time. And I, I only wanted to go to UL because I, too, I have two aunties that are living and married down here. And I used to come down to visit them as a child. And they used to automatically, they used to just go out, bring, bring us out to UL yeah. for walks because it's so beautiful. And as soon as I first saw the campus, I was like, I just want to go here. I don't care what I do. I want to go to this campus. I just fell in love with the place yeah. and then I came from quite a sporty background so obviously the sports campus there to me is just second to none so I just focused on that and I loved Irish I loved media studies and then I was looking up media courses and at the time a lot of people were saying the one in Cairo was the best and uh, Commerce and that kind of links straight into TG Car. but I just I just didn't want to go out there I wanted to go to UL yeah, and then yeah. I opened up the syllabus and there was this course Irish and New Media on Real Guys and or in UL and I was like this is just such a coincidence. Like, how could this be happening? So I had that top of my CEO. And then after that, I had every single, any course that had even just a bit of media in it, I didn't really mind. Yeah. I just wanted to go to UL. So thankfully, I think, I think I had like eight choices and I think seven of them were UL. Oh, wow. Yeah, 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 I was determined. And I got there. <laughs> and how did you get on in school? Um, really well, actually. I have kind of was one of these all-rounders. I got on really well with everyone. I kind of, a teacher one time, I think because I moved so much, from school to school like I went to three national schools two secondary schools and two universities mm. so I think I was very adaptable to situations and then I think when my parents been separated I kind of used it as a positive so I'd spend summers with dad and like that dad lived in Kildare at the time and mm. we had the horses so again there was a lot of kind of going into situations where I maybe didn't know people so I was very much so able to walk up to groups of people that were my age and just say hey can I hang out so yeah. I was I would, that's the kind of person I was and I, a teacher one time said to my mother that I was like the glue I just brought everyone together um, I got on with absolutely everyone it didn't like I, I, I never saw anyone as different or anything or I always feel like no matter how much you might think you're like you don't have um you don't know someone or you maybe don't have any interest. I feel like there'll always be something. If you dig deep enough, there'll be some common ground somewhere. Um also is always very sporty, so I think that was a, a huge thing for me as well. Um and my mum always said that she reckoned I was 
extremely clever but if I I just didn't really apply myself as much as I could have because mm. I was always playing camogie or football or horse riding and my curricular activities always came first and when it came to school I was involved in public speaking competitions and um, if there's anything happening at all in the school you can pretty much you'd pretty much find me stuck in the middle of it I was probably like always finding things to do but I always think that made me kind of like stronger as a person I think it was like better for me as well that way because I learned so many social skills and um, I also got on really well with teachers and um, I always seemed to have a really good rapport with them and it wasn't that I was like always sucking up to them or anything or like being a goody two shoes I just I think I just just got on re- I had respect for them but then I also like really kind of looked up to them as well mm. um, and I often used to go to teachers and if I'd any if I'd any issues going on or if I'd kind of you know something was whether it was something to do with education or something to do personally I always found that I could go up to my teachers and confide in them and I always felt really wow. safe around them so I think um yeah, I think it was like in school you kind of you could just see me with anyone at any time it didn't yeah. I was never really I never really liked this whole thing of groups um, and I never really stuck to groups I'd like you know I'd dip into this group at lunchtime and then I might go over to this group and over to this group I just always liked to be mixing yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I think that's kind of the kind of personality I have now and it's kind of I suppose paved the way for me in media career because obviously I have to go up talking to strangers quite a lot and interview them so yeah. I need to be able to just go up and say hey how are you can I have a chat yeah. on camera so you know I suppose it's all part of, of my life that's really interesting actually because uh, I know I was going to have a conversation with someone about the last couple of weeks about this was the fact that like your childhood really does things happen in your childhood really do affect the entire entirety of the rest of your life and it's funny the fact that you've kind of you've the fact that you were like that in secondary school you pinpointed that and gone Gee, that really has helped me out in my career or maybe yeah. that's part of me pushed you in that direction obviously having the grade will push you towards you know doing that course in college so you started in UL and you said you went to two universities so you went to another university as well yeah so I came to the end of UL and I thought I'm not ready to to work like and everyone was oh, I remember like a lot of the people in my circle we had a huge big group of us in college like in UL it was great and it was all um, people from all over Ireland and we just had such a like there's about 30 or 40 of us and it was just so much fun and I remember like Fortress they were all planning their careers a lot of them are teachers they're all applying for schools and yeah. I remember just thinking I'm not ready for this so then I realised as well I wanted to, I had studied journalism in Malta because um, at part of UL everyone goes in Erasmus so I know we're studying Irish and everyone's like why do you guys get to go away and it's like well it's part of the UL it's the way UL operate mm. so we went to Malta and while we were in Malta we studied um, reporting and journalism in the University of Malta and that was oh. just for six months but I remember the our lecturer was the nighttime editor of the Maltese Times and he was just incredible and I remember thinking he was just like I loved his lecture so much so I decided then when I got home that I was going to do a master's in journalism and um, NUIG um, was kind of the I, I'd say I loved UL but because UL was so good in those four years and because everyone was moving on I knew if I stayed on for master's that maybe I wouldn't have my same circle of friends and mm. although I'm, I can make friends easily I have such like fond memories of UL I was afraid to kind of almost damage that in any way yeah, yeah, yeah so I was like I'm going to leave in a high. So then I went to NUIG and I did the master's there for a year. And um, But it's funny because when I went, went to NUI, I didn't really know that many people. So what I did then was I just joined society straight away. Mm. And um, that year was, it was actually a really interesting year for me because that's when I hit a really low point in my life. Mm. So I was really struggling to try, get through my master's, but then also try keep my like keep everything together and I was trying to hold on to so much stuff and then I just kind of found that year to be probably one of the most difficult years of my life but then I still managed to come out my master's at the end of the day um so mm. I think for that then sometimes I have to like kind of say okay you did it give myself a pat on the back now if I had to repeat the year I would have because I didn't want to throw away the master's either but thankfully at the very end I was able to kind of pull myself out and just kind of concentrate and just get through and get to graduation so mm. um yeah, so that, that was the two universities then. So two very different experiences. But then I met the girls I met in NUIG are still like my closest friends now, oh, okay. years later. So it's it's been really interesting because while the year was quite emotional and tough, um, I've come out with like these incredible friends. And that was, oh God, a graduation in 2012. So that's a good few years ago now. <laughs> yeah. Um, so delve into a little bit of what was kind mm. of reoccurring at that time. Because you read, you talked, you talked your talk exam are really centre on that so do you want to talk about what was kind of coming up at that time yeah so I think what I, well during the masters I, I noticed the summer before I went into NUI that things were starting to kind of crumble around me and mm. um, I was always very happy and smiling and everyone used to always say that they're like you're always smiling you're always happy and I was like yeah no I am like because mm. I am but then I found suddenly I was like struggling to kind of be so happy and I was like not feeling happy anymore I was struggling to get out of bed I was struggling to go into my lectures I didn't want to go to lectures um, I wanted to go on nights out um, but I wanted to just go on night out after night out after night out and stay in bed all day long and just go out again and it was like 
I think in a way socialising and drinking alcohol was I felt was the only way I could kind of cover up what I was like that I, because I was feeling so bad but obviously alcohol has an opposite effect of so it was making me feel worse every day so I was just in this really vicious cycle where I was kind of socialising all the time and then feeling off the next day and then going out again and then it was just going on and on and on and then I remember like just feeling so emotional all the time like we used to watch Home and Away every day like religiously in college and I remember one time my housemates and I were all home at lunch watching it and I was bawling crying and then I looked around and I was like couldn't understand why nobody else was crying and I was like it's really sad and they were like yeah like it's sad but it's not like like yeah. crying sad and I was like what like what's wrong with you and they were like what? they were kind of like no like it's not that sad and then one morning I'll never forget I was watching Ireland AM and there was some someone on talking and my housemate came down and I was roaring crying into my breakfast and she was like are you okay and I was like it's just really sad it's so sad and then she was watching it with me for a bit and she was like oh god and she was like it's not that sad mm. so I think the thing was I was sad yeah, yeah, yeah. so um, I one morning then I woke up and I was crying non-stop and I couldn't stop crying and I remember I just felt horrible I felt low I felt sad I felt miserable I felt lonely and my mother came in to me and she was like right and I was like I'm losing my mind I was like I think I think I'm done for now and I was like oh, like all this like uh, the media studies like everything I want to do I wanted to be a presenter and I was like it's all gone and I'm never going to feel happy again and like my friend one, another friend said to me she like the sparkle has gone from your eyes and I could see it I looked in the mirror and I just my eyes were like gloomy and there was like nothing there yeah. and I was just so I just felt like I was at the end and then mum said no she goes now we have to concentrate on you she's like you know it's time you deal with the past and I just thought it couldn't be the past because I thought the, the, the past was the past it was so many years ago why would that be affecting me now but I suppose um, I what I've began to realise after a while when I because I, I went off and got professional help was that it was the past and because I hadn't dealt with stuff that happened in my childhood and it was coming up after me so I guess my parents separating I didn't think it was such a big deal at the time because I was five and I was so young and uh, we moved to Spiddle and we were in the beach and Irish and friends and everything and that was the summer of 95 when we had that crazy heat wave which I think now 2018 is after bypassing so we spent the whole summer on the beach so as a mm. child sure I thought this was the best place ever um, but it's only when I got older I realised that certain things from my parents separation did actually creep up like things like not having dad around as much or um, I suppose having parents living in different places but then you see I but now I'm able to look at the positives of that I said like making new friends and adapting situations yeah. but I suppose there was parts of it that were upsetting to me and kind of did cause a bit of childhood trauma so I had to deal with that then obviously the biggest blow was in 2005 uh, my brother Marcus was killed in a car crash mm. I was 15 at the time he was 18 both of us had just finished our mocks and on the Friday night I was going horse riding and he was going to rugby training and his friend our neighbour drove him because he'd just gotten a new car and I suppose back in the day this is before all those mad um, like I know nowadays it's really hard to get a licence back then I think you turned 16 you got your tractor licence and once you're 17 you just got you got your provisional and that was it you didn't need lessons or anything um, and then the boys were coming home from training and there was I suppose a bit of driver experience as well and there was a crash and both the boys lost their lives and like I remember thinking it was midterm as well and it was just a huge shock to the whole community and not just the community like we came from Dublin we lived in Spiddle so you had people from all over Marcus went to the Gwiltox for the summers and um, so you just it just was like the amount of people that came around to, to support us was incredible but at the time like I remember my parents were like obviously devastated my mother was like terrible terrible way like I can still sometimes I can still hear her cries like it was just the most painful screams ever and the same with dad so I just thought at the time, right, I have to be strong because Marcus was always a strong one for all of us. So I thought, right, this is my turn to step up now. I was only 15 years old, so I didn't really know what else to do. But I thought if I'm brave and if I look after my mom and look after my dad, you know, if I help them through it, then it'll be fine. So I tried to do that as best I could. And then my dad got really sick and he was always kind of in and out hospital and he had a lot of health complications like all through our childhood and Marcus and I would have been in and out to quite a few hospitals to visit him. But he was like the bionic man, like dad would go into hospital and a Saturday and then on Sunday he'd be out riding the horse yeah, and I'd be like dad what do you do and he'd be like the horse needs to be ridden and no one else is going to do it so I'm going to do it and he'd be like yeah but you literally just were in hospital yesterday with like drips and everything he was like I'm fine the horse needs to be ridden but I think that kind of actually kept him going I think dad constantly had goals mm. and he always like had like there would be a, a show jump competition on in like six weeks and he'd be like right I'm taking part in that and I'm like dad your health isn't strong enough and he was like my health is I'm, I don't care he's like I'm, I'm doing it but he's really stubborn and he fought through so many illnesses and he just no matter how bad things were like dad always pulled through like everyone used to always like say like we don't know, like how he was surviving we didn't really know but then again I said I think it was, again it was a goal setting it was constantly targets 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 um, but after Marcus died then I think that was just like that just wiped him out because he just I think he fought so much 
all through his life that like suddenly his son Marcus was gone in one accident like Marcus didn't even get a chance to try fight or even just a chance to even like you know get a second chance I suppose to even at life but um, I think in a way dad as well probably felt a little bit guilty that he cheated death so many times so he just got sicker and sicker and what happened was then he just couldn't fight the disease anymore and he couldn't fight anything like he like I like he'd be in the hospital and he'd if he, like get a cold or something like he wasn't able to get rid of it so um a year and a half later then dad passed away um it was august 2006 and at that stage then i had switched schools i'd gone to my second secondary school and i just want it was my leaving cert year so dad died in august september then was the start of my leaving cert year and i just thought right need to get into this year and I thought okay so I spent the time looking after mum then dad died then I went into school and I had the leaving cert and I just kept my head down focused Um, I played camogie and I got on the going minor panel that year so I think that was a huge thing for me because it was like getting to play for your county but also then being able to kind of like have a distraction so everything was a distraction for me and, and mm. go and again it was kind of goal setting too it was like get to the le- mocks get to the leaving cert get to the play for Galway get to university get your course in UL so that all happened so because life was so busy and then because I got to UL and I got and I adored it down there and I think that's why I love UL so much is because the four years down there were kind of like it's like grief decided to give me a break and said we're going to leave you off now for these four years enjoy yourself Mm. have fun but we're going to come back to you soon and that's when I came back was during my masters so it was really mixed bag for me because I I loved NUIG and I loved the masters but it was such an emotional year and then obviously what I had to deal with then for those few years afterwards were, were grief and loss and I had to go back to 93 or 4 I think when parent separation happened I had to go back and live some of those moments to get through them I had to go back to 2005 to relive Marcus's death and go through his funeral and his I suppose everything that went in with that then I had to go back to dad's death and his the dad was dying for that summer so I spent that summer in and out hospital so I had to go back to all those moments mm. and kind of relive them to get through them mm. um, so I spent I'd say I spent a good that was 2012 was the really bad year and I'd say it took me to 2015 to kind of get stuff to get get kind of like sorted and that's when I ended up coming back to Limerick now I'm not saying I'm everything's perfect now but like I had a few dips then afterwards but it was kind of just now that I know I know like when it if a dip is coming I know how to deal with it now whereas back then I didn't I was kind of looking for a quick fix all the time um, so there is no quick fix grief like Marcus died in 2005 and it took me a good 10 years to really deal with grief and to get through it yeah wow um, and then I suppose once you kind of so you say kind of 2015 you started you kind of had learned to deal with it you mm-hmm. hadn't necessarily gotten over because obviously it's not something you just get over it. but <laughs> and was there any correlation between you kind of getting over it the change in more mindset and then kind of almost launch your career you know what I mean as in like the kind of because obviously right now your, your career is prospering you know you're doing great like was there could you, was there any correlation between those two kind of your head's like getting, your head minds are getting clear and then your career kind of starting to take off yeah so I think um, I, I'm like I have really strong faith like really strong and I always feel like and when I say faith I mean I believe that Marcus and dad are always around me and always supporting me and I always feel them with me mm. and I always feel protected by them and I remember one time going to speak to um, a lovely friend Heidi and uh, she w- she told me like she's she used to get like she's to kind of like get angel messages and send them mm. and she's like this beautiful power and I remember one day talking to her and she was like you know because I, I was so inward and gone so depleted that I just was my spark was gone my like my enthusiasm was gone my energy was gone I wasn't like chasing anything I was kind of sitting back hoping that things would come for me but I wasn't doing anything to get it get work like even then career wise I wasn't like trying to get any work and then um Heidi said she goes you know Marcus thinks you're boring to look at and I was like gosh she was yeah and I was like but I'm, not, I'm not boring and then she was like well Marcus thinks you are like you're not doing anything with your career like you have your degree and you're doing masters and you're not like why aren't you out chasing things and trying to get somewhere and I was like what and I was really upset and then I kind of left the house and I was like I'm going to show you Marcus I'm going to prove to you yeah. and uh, then she um, she said to me she goes don't worry it's all going to come together and so she kind of said she she could, she could see what was coming and she was kind of I suppose instilling that belief in me so I kind of thought actually yeah do you know what I was like I'm going to prove you wrong so then I went up to Dublin and I was there for two weeks and I was applying for loads of different internships and everything because at the time like this was kind of coming out of recession when there was no paid jobs for anyone it was like you worked for free and you you were grateful to work for free and you built up your like CV yeah. so I was there and I um went along to 
Dublin and I moved up to Dublin. This was it, moving up to Dublin, no job, but I was like, I'm moving up to Dublin, I'll be here, I'll, I'll tell them all I'm here and I've got a degree and I've got a master's and I've and media and journalism and everything. And my mum's like, if you're in Dublin now and you're not working, she goes, I want, you need to be looking for jobs. So she's like, I want to know that you're sitting there applying for jobs. So I applied for like everything that I could see and I was like, hopefully something will come up. So eventually got an email and I'd gotten called for a job in London and I was like, London. I was like, oh. why did I get called a job for London? And then I was like, one of all the jobs I was applying for, I applied for this internship in London, but I didn't actually. I applied for just because at the time I was like, so if mum says, thinks I'm not doing anything, I can show her my laptop and show her all these emails to say, you know, application accepted. So she like she realised. Mm. So anyways, long story short, I ended up flying over to London and then by the time I did an interview, came out to the airport, flying home, got a call. Hey, Megan, you've got the job. You're starting in two weeks. Um, I landed an internship with MTV and I was going to be working with MTV oh, News yeah. team. And for me, I was like, MTV and I, I, I grew up watching the MTV, MTV cha- music channels. Marcus and I, when dad, dad bought a Sky for our home house and... Um, we just spent the whole time with the remote just constantly going through the MTV channels and watching movies and music videos and that was our yeah. thing. Um, so I was like, me? London? MTV? And that was not my... Like, my plan was to move to Dublin and just... Dublin was like the, the goal. Yeah, yeah. And then I got to London and the whole time I was there, London for me was the most amazing, hardest, loneliest, fulfilling year of my life mm-hmm. because I was doing an internship with MTV I had bosses who were incredible um, that were like trained me up on like equipment and lighting and sound on camera on researching on running on interviewing on like everything amazing then I also had some really tough people on my team that I worked with that were trying to shoot me down because I obviously burst in the door an intern I was like they actually one time one of the girls I worked with said to me she's like you're like really friendly and, and like it was a bad thing I went what she goes like you say hello to everyone in this building now the building was huge um, Viacom underneath it so you had Nickelodeon you had Comedy Central you had Paramount Pictures you had MTV mm. um, you had just all these like, so you would all them under one roof and like it was all open plan office so every time I was making tea or coffee there was someone from some department so I got to know everyone mm. and everyone then knew me as the Irish girl because and they used to always laugh going but you're really Irish because like, you've such a thick Irish accent and then everyone then would be like <laughs> laughing at me like they'd always be trying taking off my accent and and like that I just got to know everyone and um, yeah she said to me she kind of like she pulled me aside and was like hey you're a bit too friendly like you talk to everyone like it was a bad thing and I was like yeah okay so I said I entered that internship mad to become a proper like learned skill of presenting yeah. now I wasn't trying to become a presenter while I was there for the year because I was there to do an internship but I wanted to learn off the presenters I wanted to learn off the producers I wanted to learn off everyone in there so mm. I wanted to know but by the time I left there I remember being really depleted thinking I wasn't good enough to be a presenter because like sometimes like it was like I, I find sometimes in, me, in career like it's people sometimes want to try clip your wings and it's like mm. when it's hard to find it's and there's nothing and then, but then you meet people who really want to help you soar and that's great so I kind of try to like learn from everyone and just kind of try not to take two things too personally in careers but also London was a really lonely place because I was you're living like it's it's kind of unless you have a really tight group of friends over there you're going to find it quite lonely mm. and I just found that some weekends I could come home on a Friday and I might be on my own again till Monday because mm-hmm. re- everyone would like be gone for the weekend or everyone in the UK loves to get out to the countryside and I didn't have a car and I didn't know people in the countryside so sometimes I just go into Battersea Park with a book and that year I think I read more books than I've ever read in my life because I had to get um, public transport everywhere so I read books it was constantly books, books, books there was no internet in the underground so mm-hmm. all I do was read so that for me that was actually hugely rewarding because I got to read so many really incredible authors and then I spent weekends I had to learn how to be on my own and I had to learn how to like literally enjoy my own company which obviously is something really hard hard for anyone and that year then like I actually got to really enjoy my own company and I became really independent and I just came home like with a really great CV but also this new found independence that I didn't have before Mm -hmm. so uh, like it was a really kind of tough year in so many ways but also now looking back it was probably a really rewarding year and every time I go back to London now I just love it and like I walk back in and I'm like I think London is so vibrant and I step back in there and I'm like I just feel refreshed again Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if I'd live there again but then if the right job came up I probably would but I just find now that I think I'm so grateful to London like the way I am to UL Um, so yeah I think I've completely went off path there but yeah, no, no. It's but I think yeah, constantly yeah. spurring me on. I think yeah. So I think my, I always I said I always feel Marcus and Dad are constantly pushing me. So people nowadays say, "How do you have so much energy? How do you do so much work?" And I said, "Because I love everything I do, and I know that Marcus and Dad will be proud of me. But I also know that they'd be constantly pushing me because they're real goal getters. Like my dad was a massive goal setter. Like my dad was in the Guinness Book of World Records. Um, Dad was just like like incredible like." superhuman and um, Marcus was also like full of life and he was really enthusiastic about life and he had actually like so many plans for his future which obviously he never got to do so for me then it's kind of like 
I want to do them proud, but I also want to like do them justice as well because their lives got cut short. Yeah. And I just think now I've th- thankfully I've learned that life is so short that there's absolutely like it's just so. I know a lot of people go through tough times, and when I was going through a tough time, I thought I'd never be happy again. And here I am now, and I'm like now I feel like I know what the real meaning of happiness is, and I just think life is so short that I don't want to be having. I don't want to be upset. I don't want to be down anymore. I don't want to be having like. I don't. I, I want every day to kind of mean something I want every day to like get fulfillment out of it and I think that's what I'm doing right now mm. um, which might like I know I'm working like seven days a week but as I said I love it like I just I just kind of get such a kick out of everything I do yeah yeah no I totally understand that because I, I work seven days a week as well there's no, there's no, <laughs> there's no <laughs> week, weekends only this you yeah. know, it's not a thing you know what I mean so totally understand that but yeah it's amazing that you found something because like a, the thing that scared me the most probably when I was younger was seeing people go into jobs that they hated. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Like, as in, like, even as a young child, like, seeing people try commuting to work or people moan about their jobs. You know, if you're in the gym. So I, you know, I was, like, 14, 15 when I started CrossFit, so I would have been training with people, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 even, and, like, them moan about work, saying, oh, thank God, it's Friday evening now. I can you know, enjoy the weekend. I'm like, no, yeah. my God. Like, that sounds horrible. Like, I'm not scared. Like, that's literally scared me so much. I was like... That that's why I started the business and leaving circles. So, like, I don't want to be going doing stuff I don't want to do the rest of my life. This you know? is or people are like, oh my god, it's Monday, and I'm like, I love Mondays now because on Mondays usually RT Cork day for me, so it's like on TV. So I'm yeah. like, I love Mondays. Yeah. But um, you're totally right. I have so many friends as well, and I meet them and they're like, oh my god, like I hate my job, and I'm like, I think there was this mentality, and I think it's starting to change in Ireland where people felt you just had to get a job. Mm. You had to get a job, and if it was well paid, really good. And if you're miserable, just stay there. And that's the kind of, and where I think now with the younger millennials and the Gen Z, it's kind of like, well, no, why should we be miserable? And I like, I, I admire people that I meet that are, that change their careers. Like I met a woman at an event and she had like this really amazing like job in the medical field, like really well paid, really good job. And she just realized she was like, I'm not getting fulfillment out of it. So she completely changed her career, went off down a completely different career path. And at the time I was in a job that I was really not happy in and I knew that it was at the end and I knew it was going nowhere for me and it was just kind of, all it was doing actually was holding me back, um, making me quite miserable and making me despise my career. And I was like, no, I, I was like, I, I need to get out of this because I was like, I if I stay in this any longer, I'm going into walking away from a career that I love. So I said, no, and I, I went to see, hear her speak and I, that was a Thursday, I think, or Wednesday evening. And the following day, I went into my boss and I handed him my notice. Oh, wow. And it was the greatest feeling in the world. And I met, I, I, I met her after the event and I said, you just inspired me. I was like, there's something I need to do. Messed her after. It's like, you inspired me. And I did it. And I haven't looked back. And like, it's just my, my career now is just like, I'm loving everything that's coming my way and all these lovely opportunities and people, things are coming into me, coming towards me now. Whereas like, I remember I said to you just a while ago that I sat back and was waiting for things to come to me and nothing was coming to me because I wasn't putting myself out there whereas now I suppose I'm using social media to promote my own brand and who I am and now things are starting to come to me because people are seeing what I'm doing mm. and like that for seminar like so that, that's one of the kind of I suppose one of the main points of it like the lads saw the work that I'm doing and then realised I'd be right fit for seminar so now I'm kind of like loving the opportunities that are out there and again it's probably a lot of self-promotion which you know yourself like on social media I'm constantly yeah. having to promoting the brand that is Megan Scully. Of course. So now, like, I do have to, I do see myself as a brand now as well, which I know some people are going to be like, what? I'm like, but in this industry, you kind of, yeah, because who you are is your brand and, you know, what you put out there is is your brand mm. as well. So I'm very conscious of that um, and kind of just make sure that I put out the right brand as well and yeah. and that other brands want to work with me. <laughs> of course, yeah, because like, as in, like when you're, like you said, when you're posting, like you're always conscious of, is this true to my brand? Because like, yeah. it's a, because, like everything you put on the internet like you know there's been so many issues over the year well, not issues but so many times over the years where 10 year old tweets come up and like Kevin yeah. Hart for example that you know mm-hmm. Kevin Hart has a phenomenally strong brand like you know yeah. like that man is invincible you know is doing everything on the sun him and The Rock I think are two of the hardest workers probably in like in the public eye anyway but um you know 10 year old homophobic tweets coming up you know an up and coming yeah. comedian like a different time you know what I mean and I'm like I'm I don't know about the whole, how I feel about the whole thing of digging up 10-year-old tweets because, like, if you look at him, uh, 10 years ago, he was an up-and-coming comedian. Yeah. Comedians say outlandish stuff. He was trying to be funny, trying to build his name for himself. And then, Probably had very few followers. Yeah. Like, as in even Gary Vaynerchuk, you know, doing yeah. stuff. Yeah. Gary V was posting yesterday about, was it, 10-year-old tweets and they get, like, four likes. You know what I mean? Now he has yeah. millions and millions of followers. You know what I mean? So they all started with nothing. No one was watching. But now... I don't know who's digging up. People are getting paid to dig up old tweets, know. you know. To, it is scary. scary. Yeah. So scary. Because, like, you think, like, when I think when I first started on Twitter, like, I was probably, like, I probably had, like, 10 or 20 followers. Yeah. And, like, I was probably just, like, at one stage, like, 
someone said to me they're like you're putting out loads of tweets and twitters that like are just nothing like it was just what my random thoughts were yeah and like i know as well that when i was going through my bad phases i went through this phase of posting all these like quotes and deep meaningful things all over social media mm. now i know at the time it was actually a cry for help but i think people were kind of getting sick because they're like oh she's constantly posting these like sad quotes but like i think in, inside i was like screaming being like please someone help me yeah. and that's why i was doing it um and I think now, like, if I'd say if I saw my tweets from, like, the person I was 10 years ago is a completely different person to who I am now. Mm. Like, I was 20, and I remember thinking when I was 20 years old, um, this might sound mad, but I remember at the time being like, by the time I was 30, the way I saw myself in 10 years was married with kids. Genuinely, I was like, yeah, by the time I'm 30, I'll be married with kids. And I wanted, like, a few kids, and I, that's the way I saw it. And I was like, I'll have my house built, and I'll probably live in the countryside, and, you know, little housewife. And that was yeah. kind of, that was it. Now I'm at 30, and I'm like, oh, my God, I don't even know if I want to get married. I don't even know if I ever want kids. Mm. And I'm like, I'm, like, so career-driven right now, and I'm so, I'm loving what I'm doing. Um, I don't have my own house. I'm still renting. Um, so it's like... But the person I was 10 years ago and the person I had the mindset is completely different. They're mm. like, that's like two different people. So I'd say if I was to go back to my tweets 10 years ago, I'd probably like, sorry, who's that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, like, of course. so it's just, and I think, yeah, if you're, if you're judging people from tweets 10 years ago, I think that's really harsh because I said like, we're, you know, a 20 year old and 30 year old, there was, there, it's, it's, it's complete, it's a different generation. Mm. Um, and, you know, if people are going to judge you from your mindset that time, I think that's really like cruel. And yeah. obviously if you say stuff that is bad, you know, and what I think like Kevin Hart, I did watch his documentary. That was amazing. Yeah, um, I watched it. So well. good. He's very brutally honest in it, isn't like Very honest. Yeah, I, I was actually very surprised and I saw, saw the reaction unanimously was, I can't believe some of those clips made it in there, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, some stuff I was a bit like, oh, you didn't really need to say that. But like that, he should have apologised immediately for that, those tweets. Not, not, I know he said at the time, he, like he, he was kind of, he, I did understand his point as well, but he probably should have just said, like I am sorry for causing offence but you know that was 10 years ago yeah. um, you know it's in the past and I obviously don't mean that now and that's not who I am of course but um, yeah I know you have to be so careful with social media and that's it like you, as you said you put Anthony out there and I ran a little test on my Instagram the other day and I asked people I, I was just interested because I kind of post a bit of everything I'm mm. not like you don't you won't find like you know there's people out there who are fashion and there's people who are makeup and people who are like just certain like um sports so like you know when you go to their instagram account that's what you're always going to get whereas for me i think it's like you get my all my different media careers you'll get uh, my hiking you'll get my tag rugby you'll get my running you'll get my gym you'll get my family you'll get my dog you'll get like my travels like everything like there's no i don't have there's nothing i just go to and i just asked people privately and i said something like i wasn't going to share there it was for myself and i asked them what they why why what they like about most on my instagram and what like why and it was really interesting because i was i thought now something was going to shine through or there's gonna be one like major thing but everyone said everything they're like i love the mixture i love the the like there's always something different on your mm. page which i love and like obviously a lot of people mention my dog bella because it comes to animals everyone loves animals but the, like no one said like a lot of people said stay doing what you're doing they're like i absolutely love your content and right. i love the mixture and they're like i love the like everything like there was nothing that why nothing was actually i'd say if i was to do a percentage they were all just like on par yeah, yeah, yeah. so i was like i was like oh, that's interesting and everyone said like they're um they loved my honesty and how real i am and how like normal i am that i'm just yeah. i'm not trying to be someone else and i'm not either because i think in media you i for me like for if i want to do more tv presenting or more radio presenting like it's all about honesty to, at the end of the day because people need to connect with me as well mm. and i think maybe like being a country girl who's lived in cities I've, I think I'm, I'm getting the balance right mm. um, and I just think it's uh, yeah it was just really interesting and I was like I loved people like honesty to me as well because I you know they, they, people could have said different things but everyone was really like no just keep it going so I was like oh okay wow. yeah and um, question this is more kind of just from the whole brand perspective because mm. I know um I have a lot of, I, over the time since I started YouTube, I, be, I would have met and be friends with now a lot of the up and coming TikTokers and YouTubers and all yeah. that crack, you know, I'd be, and like, um, how, did you make a conscious decision to kind of let people in more into your personal life with the guards, your family and mm-hmm. all that? Was that like a conscious decision or was that something that maybe just developed over time? Because I know um, a lot of it's very split in that, like some people don't show family at all, there's no, you know, yeah. don't want to share that or some people like yourself that opens up and goes here this is me either take it or leave it you know what I mean and yeah. like obviously your Instagram reflects that so was that a conscious decision or something to maybe just kind of developed over time and kind of just happened yeah I think being on radio was I found radio I was always very honest on the radio and yeah. I think that's why an awful lot of people enjoyed listening to me because they a lot of people connected with me because I came from the farm and I had like a lot of farming stories and mm. then I had the dog and I had the cat and um, my mum and I uh, mum's an author as well and she's three books out and I think mum was always one that was kind of behind the scenes but then I've kind of brought her into the in, in with me and yeah. people love her like um, I'm not sure if you 
Rupert Herger, you know, this moment I on the dating show. I, I was talking, oh, yeah, I was talking to her yeah. before, before I spoke to you at your seminar. So I drag her to everything. Yeah. But I, we were on a dating show together then in the end of October, pulling my parents. And it was really nice to wow. yeah, <laughs> it was really nice to do a project together that wasn't about... Because a lot of the times people associate my mum and I with grief and with loss and with death and with yeah. Marcus and with dad. But like we want to show people that that's not just who we are. And like we both have a really funny, witty side. And I think it was so funny. The show aired and it was all about mum finding me a, a, a boyfriend. And she had to take over my dating apps and she had to like find me a man and um it, like afterwards it, it aired and then like the feedback from it was just phenomenal like everyone said how they loved how natural and real mom and i were yeah. and that we were just like we, who you meet in real life is who we are on tv mm. and uh everyone couldn't get over how funny she is everyone's like oh my god your mother is like really funny and i was like no she is like that is actually her I was like mm. you just don't all get to see it because she's because she's all in the behind the scenes so mo, i'm very open with mom on social media and she knows that too because like she's obviously on it and i'm sh- constantly sharing pictures of her and mm. videos and always having the crack with her but i think the tv show then now she's really comfortable she doesn't mind me showing stuff for her mm. i'm very conscious though of sharing um my outside family like more family members like I don't really I wouldn't post much stuff with my stepdad or my aunts and uncles or my little especially my little cousins yeah. I'd be very conscious to ask their parents first if I want to put up a photo with them mm-hmm. um, or else if I was I, mean, I go away on holidays with my friends all the time mm-hmm. um, I would be I, I say sometimes if you follow me I'd be like does she just go on holidays on her own like it's like someone to take a photo my friends don't all want to be on my social media because mm-hmm. um, I have um, I think I'm over 8,000 followers now but like they're not into that that's not their thing so mm-hmm. I'm, I'm very conscious of that of so I if I take a photo with someone um, with the girls I'll always say do you mind if I post that and the one some I know a few friends I know don't mind me posting at all and then a few that I know don't like being so I'll always mm-hmm. double check with them and I would say if there's a friend that doesn't mind me on my wall because obviously that's more permanent I'll post that and then if there's some that are like oh, oh yeah like you can post that but and then I'll put that to my story because I'm very conscious too that not everyone is into social media um, so I, go, I suppose in that sense I share a lot of my own life um, and then I suppose a huge question I get asked a lot or get kind of people always want to know about is my, my dating life because the show I didn't I obviously didn't at the end I'm single but um, I know a lot of people are very kind of interested in that side of my aspect of my life mm. did the dating show in 2019 great fun great opportunity loved being on TV with my mum and loved getting to show my mum how difficult dating is nowadays mm. and I think she was like what is this what it's like um, but I've decided now for 2020 that I'm going to keep my like that like if I am dating someone I'm not going to post them on my social media because mm. I just think that's something it's the one thing I probably can keep private if I want to and then I was like if I do share a photo with someone like I'd say it'll be like way down the line when I'm like, do you know that I, that I know that they're comfortable as well because I think once you sh- start sharing like a relationship on social media you know it, it's like you're just really exposing yourself and it's nice to have something that's private so for me like for 2020 I will be if I'm dating someone that'll be kept completely off social media because mm. I just think I said again the my brand is my social media so I have to make sure that what I'm putting on that is because like, it's just awkward because like, I've, I've, I've had an ex-boyfriend in the past where he was on my social media and plastered all over it, and then we broke up and then you're like oh do I go back and delete the photos and then I was like oh I don't I don't be that person either but then it's like I don't really you don't want photos of them either because like you just yeah. don't know again you said it, like 10 year tweets you don't know how far back people are going to go on your yeah. Instagram and start pulling up old photos yeah. so um yeah, I just remember when that relationship broke up, I just posted loads of photos, like, all the time, really fast to push them all down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and then, um, that's actually really interesting, actually, because that's something that other one is talked about very often, is that, you know, because it's kind of, you know, especially a lot of the up-and-coming media stars or the Instagram influencers and stuff, isn't like, you know, some of them will be, oh, I have, have a partner, oh, I'm going to share it all straight away, or some of them might be together for a couple of years before you, know, yeah. you see a sign of them, so... Um, and have you found this is more because because you kind of kind of talk about relationships mm-hmm. and stuff as someone in the media as someone kind of in the public eye have you had any have you had people kind of come into your life that have kind of like mainly just because you're in the public eye that have kind of maybe trying to leech you off of that or not maybe not leech off maybe leech is a bit of a strong word but kind of maybe just trying to come in because you're kind of on the rise at the moment and your career is going so well and stuff oh, well I found after the dating show an awful lot of not an awful lot sorry that sounds not an awful lot <laughs> a few people like were messing me when they because I do a QA and a afterwards and everyone's like um, did you are you dating any of the guys or what story and I said no I'm, uh, then at the time I was like no I'm still single and then I just had a lot of people going do you want to go out and date me I'd love to take you out and date and I was like oh I don't even know you so I, I like and I, I'd be very I wouldn't date someone off Instagram or Twitter or Facebook that I don't know mm. and I've, I've been asked out through social media um, straight out and I've just been I actually replied and said look I, I don't date people off, off social media I've deleted my dating apps as well because I just found that they were actually kind of depressing me and they were really kind of 
I don't know, they weren't really good. I don't think they're good for mental health. So I um, got rid of all of those. And then, but I'm, I'm fine when people ask me out and on social media. I'm just like, no, I'd rather, I'm still old fashioned. I do still think that I could like, but I'd like to meet someone the old fashioned way or, you know, maybe set up a blind date by a friend. Cause I think your friends always know who's kind of right for you. Of course. I always trust my friends. Um, I find as well, a lot of guys say they love confident girls and love career driven girls. But then I found I've dated these guys and they're, that's not the reality at all. Mm. Um, I find they sometimes feel a little bit threatened by um, the whole social media aspect and the whole media thing and being on camera and like walking, like no people kind of, not that, like not saying people know my name, but like sometimes I'll be on night out and someone like, oh, I saw you in the dating show or I watched your post show or I saw you on RT. And I found like an ex of mine really struggled with that and he and that was a couple of years ago when my social media had way less like followers yeah. and he really he didn't like because my social media is public so obviously people can can dm me and can reply to my stories and can comment and he like really had an issue with that um so it's very hard to find someone that is very supportive of this career and that's what i find and you know i'd it'd be nice to meet someone that doesn't mind coming along to these events with me or doesn't mind taking the odd photo for me if I have to you know sometimes you have to take photos course, with, if you yeah, get given yeah. something um, and that's someone that actually kind of wants to like push my career as well and push me and because sometimes I can be like my mum is my my mom, the one who pushes me my mum is constantly like making me go places and really kind of she's really like motivating me so I need to find that in a in a in a man as well or like in someone that would actually like want to push this career and want mm. to see me go further so I found that's been quite difficult to find someone and then like that too I suppose you're conscious of like I've been chatting to guys on nights out and then they kind of like they kind of say make compliment like, oh my god like I, I love um I know they, they make some comp about something really personal in my life and I'm like oh god and then I'm like okay and then I kind of get really awkward because I'm like oh jeez and then I'm like uh, then I'm afraid then that they know too much about me and then I don't feel to have a conversation with them because I'm yeah. like so I'm, they're going oh god what do they not know about me that I can kind of say to them because if they follow me on Instagram they're going to know my mother my dog where I'm from where I live my jobs <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah no actually yeah it's funny it is funny that's a funny situation when someone does listen to you and consume your content and then yeah. you meet them because like you don't feel like you're, you're starting on a bad foot and like you said because like you're like well like oh, am I going to ask a stupid question or say something that they're like oh yeah I already know that like oh, you know it's a, yeah. it can be a bit and yeah. then you feel bad because you're like sorry I, I, I don't know anything about you so you know can you tell me about yeah. you just give me a spiel just give me a full monologue of who you are what, you, what yeah. you've done for the last you know X amount of years but um so so then kind of moving into the media so you so kind of pulling all back then so you finished you did your internship with MTV for a year yeah. and then where was the next step came back to Ireland and what was kind of the next step then came back from London and I went to Dublin I actually went into PR for a while because I couldn't get a media job in Dublin to save my life and mm-hmm. I had and I have to say like I'm, I'm not just boasting but I had a great CV from MTV because MTV made sure that I that was the whole point of the internship in MTV you walk away with a, like amazing CV yeah. and that's what they do and every intern that was before me in MTV stayed in they're all most they actually they're all from UK I was the only Irish intern and they all stayed there and all got like amazing jobs and I follow some of them now like one of the girls is um, a massive uh, climate activist over in the UK with 100,000 followers on Instagram wow. another girl is a presenter on um, Capital One Breakfast um, oh, that's a big race. Yeah, yeah so like you know they're all doing really incredible things and um, another guy is doing this amazing like um, <coughs> uh, producing and directing and he gets to shoot with like all these top footballers in the world like Messi and like all these really cool mm. ones so like they all could stay there in London and like at the time looking back probably should have stayed in London because I could have easily gotten a career and the Irish accent used to get me really far over there but I was like no I want to live in Ireland and I couldn't get a job for the life of me I couldn't get anything so I went into PR and I did that for about three or four months and I was like if I see another Excel sheet I'm going to scream and it was that situation where I was like I can't do this anymore and I was like I need to get back into media so I went into another unpaid internship for a while to try to get back into media with a media company and that was went on and on and on and again I just couldn't get a job so like I was applying for all these jobs with these other media companies and like they're all they're doing was offering me unpaid internships and I was like I can't stay living in Dublin on an unpaid internship and they kept saying but after six months we'll more than likely keep you on and I was like but I can't take that risk because that's six months living in Dublin that's six months of my mother paying for my rent and paying my way I was like I had I, like what like how am I meant to survive mm. then I kind of turned a bit sour in, in Dublin because I was six months up there no, I was uh, first sorry, six months working in PR, which I didn't like, and then I was six months working up there unpaid, and it was just horrible. Like living in Dublin with no money is not a fun place. Like and it, and it just and I was going home every weekend and I was miserable, and I was driving every Sunday driving back to Dublin and I was miserable. And I just said to mum one day, I was like, I can't do this anymore. I was like, I need to come home. So I moved back home with no job, but I was like, at least I wasn't costing my mother all this money. Of course, yeah, uh, a little yeah, yeah, crazy. And then I was in Galway and I was like, I didn't know what to do, so I was doing a bit of freelance stuff and I ended up working with them. Um, 
a few like fitness trainers doing their social media for them and stuff like that so that was going well and then I was mum just said look she goes stay at home for as long as you want but she goes you need to decide now what you want to do she goes the, the, you know now just use this time to really think do you want to stay in media if you want to stay in media then go for it if you don't want to stay in media look at your other options so that's why I kind of took that time at home to like free my mind and also to weigh up my options and see what did I really want to do and that's when a job came up in Limerick and a radio job so I went for it and I ended up getting that and the reason I got it, because I asked, was because of all my experience in London in MTV. Brilliant. So my CV finally worked for me. Um, so that was how that came about. So yeah, I feel like I've gone off point again on you. No, no, no. As in like, that <laughs> Rambling way like Matt. No, 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 no. Because um, you actually, you're stringing the story along, or we're going along the kind mm. of story. And was that with the Limerick Post Show, or was that a different, that was a different radio station than Limerick Yeah, it was out? Spin. Um, so I was with, did the breakfast show there for, um, I ended up being there for, Three years I think it was I did the breakfast show for two and a half ish and then I went to a mid morning show which was great and then yeah just just I kind of like felt like it was time for a change because I think like I, I feel like with careers you kind of have to <coughs> I think I never want I've never stayed in a career a job too long yeah. and that was three years was the longest I'd stayed in something I thought right I'd done everything I'd learned how to be a radio presenter I'd done the breakfast show which is you know the most important show in the station because it's like big listeners I'd done a show on my own um, I'd learned how to do the desk I had done all these things and I just decided and then I brought out my book then in the meantime so after the book was brought out then I kind of was like right I need a change now I knew I needed something else a new project and that's when I and then I left there in January February of last year and I decided to take a break so I took like eight weeks off uh, just for myself and just to have like just to kind of take a break because I think like it's very important to go if you're going from a career to another career I think it's really important to take some time out as well because this thing of finishing one job on Friday and starting a new job on Monday I'm like no give yourself like time off like mm. I mum and I went to America I went to Cheltenham with the girls I like did loads of cool trips and like really fun time so then by the time the Limer Post started then in May I was like raring to go do you know that kind of way it was like loads of ideas loads of op- like loads of kind of energy and then I was just kind of ready to to start mm. again so that's how that all happened and then you ended up coming here to live approach in may yep yeah. to produce this show and that's been since may and for the summer we we're kind of working on different like kind of pilots and seeing what worked well and what format we wanted and then by the time it was like midsummer we came up with the format so we go around and we interview people monday to friday sometimes you might have two or three interviews in a day sometimes you might have one and then mm. we churn out videos pretty much every single day but then on friday is the main show and the main show then is um the top stories in limerick which is the top stories in the newspaper and um, because the newspaper is is is, is the big the, the, the master here yeah. um, and then we have the out and about section which is all the events we went to during the week and then the big interview is usually a big specialised interview with someone so be it a fashion designer um, a musician um, maybe someone that's in town like it could be anyone so yeah. it's, it's very so it's great so that's yeah that's kind of the, 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 the main baby right now yeah, I, I'm, we're only having a discussion with this before we started actually recording was the fact that you are, it's, it's on YouTube, it's a YouTube show as well, yeah. you know, and like, I feel like media, we were talking, literally just having this conversation before we started, was like, media in Ireland is still quite behind, I know I'm not really in the media space at all, but kind of just from an outsider's perspective, you know, the fact that like, all the big TV shows in the States are now putting their stuff up onto YouTube, because obviously, that's where I consume most of my content. I like, yeah. if I'm going to content, so I don't go to Netflix, I don't go to Netflix, I don't go to TV, I go to YouTube, but that's where I go to consume video content, you know what I mean? So having it up there is brilliant. And um, even I'm talking to MTV, actually, they're now backlog and stuff, like shows that were telling 10 years ago, yeah. they're, they're trying to upload that to YouTube and they're getting millions of views, you know what I mean? Like, as in like, and that's really turning at the moment. So it's interesting how the whole media landscape is all those you know, all these conventional you know MTV Comedy Central Comedy Central put so much content up yeah, and just throwing do. it up onto YouTube and it's really cool the way that you're kind of almost leading in that sense with the guards because I don't think from what I've seen anyway most of the other media channels in, Ar- in Ireland and radio shows aren't really doing much on YouTube at all really yeah and that's what I think we're kind of like that's what I love about the Limit Post show it's kind of like it's unique in a way um, as you said not many people are doing it and no. like we're having great fun with it because we're not like it's not like strict where we had to like follow a certain rule or a certain guideline it's like us like trying out things to see what works and see what our audience like yeah. and um, we're using all the platforms on social media to, to get everything out there um, so it is really interesting to see and like it's just like I'm so proud of it I yeah. like I see every time I see the branding I'm like oh that's yeah. add your name, your name under like, I know yeah. my name on it too so it's lovely and it's like you know I always wanted to be a presenter growing up like I always wanted to be 
doing some sort of like presenting and um, now that I'm doing it I'm loving it and the fact that I'm getting to do so I'm doing which obviously digital media is huge now so the fact that I have my own show online on YouTube is like massive then I also have the TV and then I have the radio as well so yeah. I feel like I've got all and I do a little bit of writing for the paper as well so like I feel like I'm hitting all the media targets which I love um, it's ever changing as well which is so fascinating and I love that as well and I just think it's like it's so fast paced and as I said I have so much energy that and I'm, I've, I've got a really fast pace as well so I think it's really cool trying to keep up with it but also like staying ahead of the trends and yeah. watching the trends and it's just like it's fascinating mm. and which out of all the platforms because like, you literally like literally, like literally you literally said you touch on every media platform <laughs> really which one do you kind of enjoy the most and what kind of what aspect I know you enjoy all your jobs obviously yeah. I think you said that but which one do you kind of almost enjoy the most I love the Limer Post show. Which is funny. I, they're, they all have different points. The Limer Post show I love because I get to go out and about Limerick and I get to meet people and I get to interview people and share that content to Limerick people all over the world that maybe haven't don't get to see it. And I think we get the feedback we get is people who are out international love seeing what's going on. And I loved like meeting people and getting stories often because I think you know interview people and talking to people is kind of my, that's always been my passion. And um, so for that I love that about the Limerick Post show. And then I love as well I love live TV the buzz I get off it because I love knowing that like you're sitting there and it's live and you're in a studio and there's lights and mm. it's like this is live and that gives me a real adrenaline rush and um, then radio I just love the fact that like now not that I can roll out of bed because I'm the studios in Dublin but I love just radio you can just well, you can just head on in there and you're behind you're on your own in this room you got your microphone and you are like chatting to people and you're playing music and that's just really relaxed mm. and I don't see the radio for me is so much like it's fun so I don't look at that as like a job I just see that as like I'm going up having a crack chatting yeah. chatting and playing music which is like what I love doing anyways mm. so um, I think the three of them all have really strong points um, that I love and then you know the paper is still so strong here in Limerick the Limerick Post is like such a strong newspaper and it's such a loyal readership mm. so it's funny like I interviewed Willie O'Dea in, in here in this room and um, that went up online and then a, a few days later I transcribed the interview and put it into the newspaper and I people come up to me saying oh I read your article with Willie mm. but like they didn't necessarily see it online yeah. so there's still a huge audience out there I suppose that ha- aren't consuming um, media, digital, digital media the way you and I do yeah. um, so it, that's always really fascinating for me and uh, one time I think it was Dermot and Dave were down here doing a road show and like that Dermot picked up the Limer Post and he was uh, made uh, reference to my in- article with Willie O'Dea mm. so he saw that in the paper so he didn't see it online so it's just it's fascinating like, I just think and for me it's like, great because I know that I'm hitting so many different target and areas and people and age groups and everything mm. with all my media yeah and then you're saying there that you're after launching a cooking podcast now yes. as well. Yes. So is that exclusively your own stuff? That's not linked. Is that linked to any other entity at all? Yeah, it's hosted on the Limer Post. That's on the Limer Post. Yeah. So that's the, so that'll be going up on their YouTube channel as well, is it? It is, yeah. Okay. The, um, the, so what we're doing is we it's a food podcast and we'll be releasing the audio, we'll say, for an episode early in the week and then we'll release the video later in the week because yeah. again some people prefer video, some people prefer audio. Cool. And obviously it's cooking so it's interesting because the audio, like you're listening to it but I think... Um, Owen and I did a good job that you could you can almost I think you can visualise the kitchen and yeah. um, so then now when the video comes out it'll be just interesting to see what people consume more of and mm. um, we've kept it very basic it's meals for millennials he's a professional chef I'm not and um, I'm so busy I don't have time to be cooking these like long amazing roast dinners and anything and but I'm always up for healthy nutritious meals so mm. the aim of this is for him to teach me but also teach our audiences and, and listeners and viewers how to make these basic healthy nutritious meals and it's funny I got inspiration from the Today Show because one of the topics I had one week was um, the most uh, search term on uh, Google uh, last year was how to boil an egg so that was a conversation we were having on TV so then I was like to own episode one how to boil an egg and I, like everyone's like Megan it's like it's simple you boil an egg and I was like no but I was like how do you get like the soft egg the, you know the hard boiled eggs I find every time I boil an egg it's a hard boiled egg and I want a soft boiled egg mm. so then that was episode one he was teaching me how to know the difference so that's what we did we got mm. like a load of eggs and we did them from like runny to soft to all the way up to a hard boiled egg so that was fascinating and in it we're not just talking about how to boil an egg we're chatting about hens and like sourcing eggs and protein and all the things you can do with eggs and all the different th- meals you can make and so it was really interesting in that sense we, I learned loads about it like I didn't realise that when you read the shell of an egg it says if it says IE first that means it's an Irish egg oh I, I didn't even read it yeah, there you go there you go <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and then sometimes if it's um, I think the UK it'll say UK in it yeah yeah so all the information is there on the egg so I was like I didn't know that so, so, <laughs> yeah. that's, so they're informative as well and they're like interesting so I said that's the first one and we will make her we will build to get me better at cooking <clears throat> sorry excuse me um, more I suppose 
difficult kind of meals but for him mm. it's simple he's just like no you just do this but he made everything so simplified that I loved that mm. so I can't wait now to start rolling out all the episodes and then I want to recreate everything yeah when yeah, I go home yeah, on my yeah. own just to like see if I can do it without him yeah. <laughs> keep, keep your Instagram obviously updated on yeah. how it goes um, so two final questions before we wrap up one it's something you touched on earlier and just because we kind of skated past it but uh you said your dad was a Guinness World Record. What was it? Oh, yeah. Um, so my dad grew up on horses. He was um, a show jumper and he wore the green jacket for Ireland. And I think he got his kidney transplant when he was 21 in the late 70s. I, I might have these dates wrong. In the, mid, in the early 70s, he was 21. <clears throat> Actually, it's funny. My mum was in school at the time and she remembers they were, everyone was praying for this man, this young guy from Gort that was getting a kidney transplant. Mm. She didn't know obviously who dad was. But at the time, transplants weren't a thing in Ireland. So it was mm. really rare. And um, dad was given three days to live because the kidney didn't take. Um, but eventually there was um, his, his, my granddad who was a vet um, kind of got involved and basically the kidney took and dad was told leave in hospital like you know you've had a transplant so take it easy no like no nothing too strenuous like no smoking no drinking like literally you have to really look after yourself so like dad of course did not listen to any of the doctors um and then in the early 80s he was in the rds in the simmons court and there was a world record competition going on and dad was like i really want to take part and they were like no like we're not signing you in like you're you're a, basically effectively a sick man and they were like we're not letting your health isn't good enough and dad was like i'm fine you know I'm, I'm fine i'm doing it so he saw a horse jumping this is actually a true story he saw a horse jumping in the arena the day before the competition mm. and he was like i want that horse i want i'm gonna have that horse and i'm gonna jump tomorrow so he spent the evening trying to buy this horse off this man who i think wasn't even selling the horse um drum logan was like a uh, was i think he was like 17 2 or 18 1 big chestnut horse beautiful horse and dad literally i think sat up with him that night and was like yeah he'll do and it was like you're taking part in a like a jumped like in this jumping competition on a horse you don't even know mm. um, but dad just dad had the eye for horses he was incredible like I used to go racing with them and dad would literally look at the parade reading and he'd be like he'll come first and he'll come second and it used to happen and my first time to go I raced and won the first four races and this is like dad would just look at a horse and knew he just had that that magic touch wow. which I thought I had but I realised last couple of years going to race meeting and I do not um, and then um, so then he got in that day and again there was loads of war like they did not want to let dad jump because of his health condition and they were like you know you're too much of a liability and if that happens yada 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 so then dad decides well I'm going to take the saddle off so then they were like what so dad's like I'm going to take this on bear back so um, he'd go in and obviously it was a high jump competition so everyone goes in and jumps and then they bring it up and up until eventually there's like a winner um, obviously if you knock you're out so dad said he um, he remembers going into the arena and obviously he's very nervous too because it was a huge thing and the jump was like six foot seven and a half so it'd be like higher than a door frame wow. and yeah and it was poles so like obviously poles you can see through them now in the audience horse show the puissance is a wall so the wall like so obviously the horse probably it's easier for them to see a big wall whereas the poles you kind of well not that horses can't they can see poles but like just you know you just wouldn't know what would distract them so um, he rode down to it and it was like I think it was like a triple bar or like um, this big oxer which means it was kind of like going down a level so like you kind of, a horse kind of didn't just have to jump over kind of to like leap over it Yeah. so he rode down to it and um, he said he was going over it and he was coming down and he could hear poles being like dry. he heard the poles fall and he just said ah sure look you know I gave it a good go mm. and he landed and next to me he, the horse took stride and he said the whole place erupted and then he was like what and then he turned around turns out guys were like moving poles at the side cleared the jump no and was in the Guinness Book of World Records in the early 1980s jumping highest jump bareback wow yeah incredible stuff that is an incredible story yeah so yeah so as I said that's why the doctors were like look after yourself I have to say the time that dad died in 2006 he was at that time was the longest surviving kidney or uh, transplant recipient of any um, organ in when he died mm. so he was a lot yeah so like he was very proud of that fact and he always actually said he reckoned it's because he was so like goal driven and because he set himself so many targets and because he was constantly like you know chasing life he never took a break and I think that's why he lived as long as he did because he just was like as I said it was constant goal setting whether it was going out riding a horse or mm. it's usually horse related actually he was like at one stage he was like he was like even for the Beijing Olympics and we were, I was like dad like you definitely can't and he was like what do you mean I can't and I was like oh you shouldn't have said that and then he went off and got a horse literally the next week rang a friend said need a horse I'm going to the Olympics what have you got black stallion king cotton gold arrived over a few days later from Wales and we were both trained dad and I were training them together and dad was tar- was setting up for the Olympics but wow. um, 
that's when my brother passed away and then that's kind of when dad gave up but I remember then thinking I was like you have the Olympics come on fight you mm. have the Olympics you have your goal but it was just it, it, it was too much for him but I think if Marcus didn't die I'd say dad would have given it a good goal <laughs> <laughs> um, so I was going to like to find, find uh, wrap up these kind of questions so um, what advice would you give to someone let's say teenager or someone in their early 20s uh, line up for a career in media want to go down a similar route that you mm. did like, what would you advise? Like, what's the landscape looking like right now? Any advice you'd give that, to that person? I would say build up as much experience as you can. Um, for me, I if I knew anyone in like the local radio stations, the local newspapers or local digital media like outlets, just get reach out to them because people are very sound and I think reach out to them. Um, do your research though. If you're going to reach out to them, make sure that you know like who you're reaching out to and what they do. Like if there's a brand that you particularly enjoy, like, you know, get onto them. So when I was in Malta, I had to get an article published. That was our assignment in a paper. Mm. Um, and they were like to us, you can get published in an Irish paper. It doesn't matter. All that we do is bring back a clipping. So I um, reached out to the Galway Advertiser at the time and I said, look, could I uh, write an article for you um, about Maltese food? And they were like, yeah, absolutely. So my mum knew someone that, that works there. So that happened. And then like that was connection. And then when I was doing my master's in, in Galway, they got onto me again. They're like, would you write a few articles for us over the Christmas? We need someone to do a few like, features and I was like absolutely so that's how that happened so I'd say like networking is huge it's so hugely important I know some people kind of think like what and I'm like that's why a lot of people say to me like you're always out and about and doing things I was like because you, you just don't know where you'll meet someone like I have my business cards with me at all times like you could be on a night out and you'll meet someone who's like has some there's something business related there or something that you know can help you out um my mum one time um met Hector when he used to present the 2FM breakfast show and he was in Galway then was in the Galway studio and mum was like my mo- daughter's mad into media any chance you could she come in to one of, the, one of the shows so then like I was sat into one of the 2FM breakfast shows just watching it all wow. so it was little things like that a teacher um, had a friend that worked in TG Carr and knew that I loved Irish knew that I loved media sent me out there for a few days work shadowing so that was like so it's all those things TG Carr then hired me to do some modelling for them and then now of uh, recent I've done um, some vlogs for them as well so you know it's all connections and it's all and I'd say as well is when you connect with someone connect them on social media then if you get to go for work experience or shadow or even meet them for coffee coffee's a great thing like just say to someone look can I please meet you for coffee I'll come meet you where are you we'll catch up um, and like like pick their brains and ask them for advice and ask them for like is there any chance and you just don't know who will be able to offer you like what opportunity and then when you leave that place even if it's only for an hour or two hours connect them on LinkedIn connect them again on social media reach out to them if you get their email address write to them saying thank you so much and email them and say this is my email address love to like keep in touch with you and vice versa it's just about constantly keeping those connections going because you just never know who you're going to meet yeah. down the line um, and I think as well when you meet someone who's like enthusiastic and really wants to learn um, like I find for me if I meet someone like that I know that if they reach out to me I'll be like yeah I remember you you were like you really like you're really eager and you want to learn and I, I'd like I hope someday to take on an intern and I want to give them the training and experience that I got in MTV because I want them to walk away with like a bustling CV as well and I want yeah. them to like walk away being really trained and know exactly like what's going on and mm. and all that so I'd and I'd say don't give up because it it's a really hard industry to get into it's really hard to break into I said I think I only like I graduated in 2012 it was 2015 by the time I was actually getting properly paid um so I was doing a lot of free stuff which I it is wrong I, I don't agree with getting people to do stuff for free um but sometimes you like even just a few weeks here and there just to build up some kind of a portfolio mm. um, and just be humble and be genuine and be polite and be honest and I think kindness goes such a long way and um, I think genuine people will I know like sometimes you see people like jumping really rising really fast and um, you know and I just think being nice to people is, is really hugely important and I think it'll it'll make it for a longer career for you as well because if you're nice and you're humble and you're all these things people will remember you and when people remember you like you'll, people will want to work with you like you know there's nothing nicer than a person who's nice to work with because when you build up that rapport with someone they might move on somewhere else and then they might bring you with them or they mm. might like you know it's all about like networking and helping each other out so yeah don't give up and be sound yeah I think that's a great way to finish it <laughs> off uh, what would you like to put, plug your social media obviously I'll include it all down below but anything you want to just kind of plug before we head off yeah um, Instagram Twitter and our Megan Scully and as is LinkedIn and then uh, Facebook is Megan Mixed by Megan Scully and I am not on TikTok and I've stopped using Snapchat as well okay. so I'm just sticking to those for now but yeah Instagram I suppose at the moment is probably my biggest one but I, st- I still think Twitter and Facebook are great as well actually I, I really think they're all really good um, so yeah if you just search because I'm, I'm M-E-G-H-A-N-N so if you search for Megan Scully I should hopefully pop up yeah that's great <laughs> thank you very much for coming Thanks, on today. really appreciate it if you enjoyed the episode, subscribe down below, go follow Megan, and uh, yeah, we'll see you next week. Good night, really.